Today, asbestos is pretty much singularly known as something dangerous that used to be used in building materials. Billions of dollars are spent in asbestos abatement, and ads play on television offering legal help to people who have been exposed to asbestos. If you have an older home, you might worry about whether there's asbestos in your home. Uh, asbestos became so popular and used during the industrial era that we sometimes forget that it's not a new invention. It's a naturally occurring mineral, and one that has a surprisingly long history with humanity. Asbestos has been used in production for at least 4,000 years, and before it became known as a notorious killer, it had a very different reputation. The surprisingly long human relationship with asbestos is history that deserves to be remembered. Asbestos is an umbrella term that refers to six different naturally occurring silicate minerals composed of thin fibrous crystals. The fibers are made up of even smaller pieces called fibrils, which can be as small as a single micron in length. The most commonly used type is called chrysolite, or white asbestos, which makes up about 95% of the asbestos in most products, but a number of other kinds are recognized, including brown and blue asbestos. It functions naturally as an electric insulator. It is highly resistant to heat, it's chemically inert, and it strengthens other materials when mixed. In Greek, the substance we now call asbestos was originally called emiantos, meaning undefiled, because it showed no mark it was thrown into a fire. The Greek word asbestos actually referred to quicklime, but the Roman magistrate, Pliny the Elder, misused the word in his natural histories to refer to the incombustible material, which helped to popularize the name. In its modern use, the word asbestos was first used in the 1600s. Use of asbestos, however, goes back much further than that. 4,500 years ago, in East Finland, ancient people mixed asbestos into their clay, which strengthened the pots while allowing them to have thinner walls and adding heat resistance. The ancient Egyptians wrapped pharaohs in asbestos cloth to prevent deterioration. In Cyprus, ancient people made asbestos cremation cloths, hats, and shoes, and the island seemed to be a major source for the mineral. Greek historian Herodotus and Pliny both mention using asbestos cloths in cremations to wrap the body and keep the body's ashes separate from the fires. Pliny also says asbestos protected wares from spells, especially those of the Magi. Many cultures use asbestos to make napkins, tablecloths, and clothes. More than one writer made the same observation as the Greek historian Strabo, who said that these cloths were thrown into the fire and cleansed, just as linens are cleansed by washing. The fibers were also used as insulation for homes and ovens. Asbestos can be used to make candle wicks that don't burn away. One was used in the asbestos lynchinus, a golden lamp that, according to one traveler, only needed to be refilled once a year. The eternal flame cared for by the Roman Vestal Virgins may also have used an asbestos wick, and numerous writers say the elemental flame of the Athenian Acropolis had an asbestos wick. Even ancient writers recorded troubling things about asbestos. Both Pliny and Strabo mentioned that slaves that mined the mineral suffered from diseases of the lungs, and it was said that quarry slaves died young. Pliny called it a slave disease, and even described goat or lamb bladders being used as respirators. Despite these observations, they never really truly understood the risks of the mineral. Asbestos continued to be used throughout the world throughout the Middle Ages, though it seems to have declined somewhat. Charlemagne, first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, was said to have had an asbestos tablecloth that he impressed dinner guests with by tossing it into the fire at the end of the meal. Medieval monks on Cyprus used asbestos in their paint, adding a mirror-like sheen to their paintings. This substance was rare enough for traveling salesmen to make asbestos crosses they claimed were blessed when they didn't burn. It's also used as insulation in the armor of some knights and crusaders in the 11th century are said to have filled asbestos bags with burning tar to fire out of trebuchet. In Asia, the Han Dynasty general Long Qi was said to have a suit of asbestos cloth that he would wear to special occasions. He would refuse tea until it was spilled on him and then, feigning anger, have the clothes thrown into the fire where they would come out clean. In the same period, asbestos became associated with something unexpected, the salamander. The salamander was poorly understood in antiquity, but it had for centuries had a connection with fire. Some medieval alchemists even declared the salamander a fire elemental. As early as the 4th century BC, Aristotle connected the amphibian with fire, and Pliny said the creatures were so cold they could extinguish fire. The Jewish Talmud also mentions the salamander, claiming it is a product of fire. The Greeks and Romans detailed the mining of asbestos, but by the Middle Ages, society seems to have forgotten its origins. Apparently novel to Middle Age thinkers was the idea that asbestos was actually the fur of a salamander, and it was called salamander wool. Arab scholars more often thought it was the cut feathers of an exotic bird, while some Chinese authors described a kind of rodent that lived in volcanoes.
British polymath Sir Thomas Brown later suggested that asbestos has taken on the metaphorical name of salamander wool, but that the people started to take them too literally. In the 13th century, Marco Polo learned of asbestos mining in Asia, and he wrote that the real truth is that the salamander is no beast, as they allege in our part of the world, but is a substance found in the earth. Still, the myth of the salamander persisted. Even Leonardo da Vinci thought that the salamander had no internal organs and survived off fire alone. In the early modern period, scientists turned to the utility of asbestos. Research into the material exploded starting in the 17th century. By 1700, the Royal Society had published eight reviews and letters on the mineral, and in 1727, the first full volume on asbestos was published, followed quickly by two others. New applications seemed to appear every day. Italians made asbestos paper and later asbestos banknotes, and fireproof gloves, capes, and clothes appeared in the traveling show of the human salamanders, who were known for cooking a steak while standing in a bonfire. Benjamin Franklin carried an asbestos coin purse with him in his youth so that the money would never burn a hole in his pocket. He sold it in 1724 to the eventual benefactor of the British Museum. Giovanni Aldini, known for his experiments using electricity to move the muscles of cadavers, invented a line of fireproof clothing for firefighters in the early 1800s, which became popular in places like Paris and Geneva. Asbestos stage curtains were credited with saving lives in theater fires, and others suggested making an indestructible book of eternity of asbestos paper. Possibly the most important use for asbestos were in construction. Mixing with rubber created a fire-resistant compound that allowed far more resilient steam gaskets, vitally important in advancing steam engines and boilers. In the 1860s, Henry Ward Johns created an asbestos tar paper for roofs, which could protect buildings from fire. It was this invention that began to truly open markets for the product. Austrian Ludwig Hatzchek created fire-resistant building panels that could be both thinner and stronger, which led to hundreds of products based on his invention, including asbestos tiles, corrugated panels, and ceiling moldings. The fireproof material caused a sensation and was hailed as a miracle mineral that could save thousands of lives in an era that lived in fear of building fires. Asbestos was perfect for the industrial age. It was versatile and easily added to other materials. It was mixed into cement and wood to create fireproof ships and included in all kinds of plastic items for increased strength and as a binder. It would become a staple of the flooring industry in vinyl asbestos tile. It was widely used as insulation on pipes, water heaters, and engines, especially in trains and ships, which used the product extensively. It was even used to make juice filters and breathing apparatuses. As demand grew, production had to match it. The first industrial asbestos mine was opened in the Thetford Hills of Quebec in the late 1870s, and thriving industries also blossomed in Germany, England, South Africa, Australia, and Finland. It quickly became mechanized, and by 1900 there were more than 30,000 tons being produced annually. Henry Ward John's company invented more asbestos construction products, but John's himself would die in 1898, probably of asbestosis. The company would merge with the Manville Company to become one of the biggest players in the industry, John's Manville, in 1901. It was in the late 1800s and early 1900s that medical professionals started to notice health issues connected to asbestos. In 1897, a doctor in Austria attributed a patient's breathing problems to breathing asbestos, and an 1898 report by the British government cited widespread damage and injury of the lungs due to the dusting surrounding of the asbestos mill. The first confirmed death from asbestosis was reported in England in 1906 by Dr. Montague Murray. Murray performed an autopsy on a 33-year-old patient and found large amounts of asbestos fibers in his lungs. Across Europe, other reports of deaths from fibrosis were reported. Insurance companies were aware of the dangers too, and as early as 1908, they decreased coverage and increased premiums for workers in the factories that used asbestos. Asbestosis is the damage caused to the lungs by tiny asbestos fibers. The scarring within the lungs hinders oxygen from being transferred to the blood. It can take time for the symptoms to present because lungs have a kind of excess capacity, but once this excess is gone, the symptoms grow worse very quickly. Before it was understood, the symptoms were often missed because it was often seen in conjunction with tuberculosis and pneumonia. In 1924, the death of Nellie Kershaw, who had worked spinning asbestos into yarn, led to an inquest in which the pathologist Edmund Cook identified minerals found in Kershaw's lungs as the primary cause of the fibrosis of the lungs and, therefore, of death. Because of these and other cases, Edward Roland Allworth Merriweather decided to study asbestos workers in textile factories. With the help of C.W. Price, an industrial engineer and pioneer of dust monitoring, Merriweather put the dangers of asbestos into the greatest context yet. A full quarter of the workers were suffering from asbestosis, 
and those who had worked longer were sicker. The report underlined the seriousness of the disease, and within a year, legislation was passed in the UK to make efforts to reduce asbestos dust and require medical screenings for employees. Merriweather felt that the study meant asbestos workers faced inevitable death. The study was published simultaneously in the United States and became the most prominent study proving the danger of asbestos. In 1933, Johns Manville confidently settled 11 claims from workers seeking disability due to lung damage. Thousands more would be brought against asbestos companies in the 1920s. The companies were not blind to the danger. They began sponsoring much of the research into the risk, especially through the Cernak Laboratory in upstate New York. The industry expected to control the outcomes, as one sponsor explained. It's our further understanding that the results obtained will be considered the property of those advancing the required funds. This enabled them to suppress some of the results of a 1940 study where 81% of lab mice exposed to asbestos dust developed lung cancer. The warning signs couldn't slow the industry. Production tripled between 1900 and 1910, and in the late 1930s, asbestos was already massively popular. In 1939, the Johns Manville Company built an asbestos man, protecting mankind's buildings for display at that year's World's Fair. The growing tensions of World War II caused countries to stockpile asbestos for fear of disruptions in production. In the U.S., asbestos was used in almost every facet of the war effort. Bazookas, jeep engines, torpedoes, and ship engines all used asbestos. Even army medics carried it as an easily sterilized dressing. Use in American shipyards led to high rates of lung cancer and mesothelioma in shipbuilders. U.S. asbestos consumption grew astronomically during the war. In 1942, the U.S. was consuming 60% of the world's production, up from 37% just five years earlier. In 1949, Meriwether again broke ground with his annual report by the Chief Inspector of Factories for 1947, which showed that victims of asbestosis were much more likely to develop cancers of the lung or lung lining than victims of silicosis in the general population. The results were anonymously published shortly after in America, proving that the connection between lung cancers and asbestos. The first physician to make the connection was actually the German H. W. Wedler in 1943, but the ongoing war meant his research was ignored. Meanwhile, the use of asbestos in the United States actually reached its peak in the post-war years. In Europe and Japan, asbestos was used widely in the construction necessary to rebuild war-torn nations. While in the U.S., the practical uses of asbestos meant it became an integral part of thousands of products. Put into brake pads in cars and elevators, used in hair dryers, air conditioners, electric insulation, fake snow, including that used on the set of The Wizard of Oz, surgical thread, irons, and the filters of Kent Micronite cigarettes, and even as an abrasive, in toothpaste. But the consensus that the product was dangerous continued to grow. Multiple reports connected to occurrences of several kinds of cancers. And in 1964, Dr. Irving Selikoff presented findings that deaths at a New Jersey asbestos factory were 25% higher than would be expected statistically. Still, in the U.S., the powerful asbestos companies worked hard to downplay the risk. The peak of asbestos consumption in the U.S. was reached in 1973. By the 1960s, growing understanding that even small amounts of exposure could cause serious health defects finally began to take a toll on public opinion. The Environmental Protection Agency, created in 1970, became the Crusader. In 1973, it banned spray-on asbestos for insulating and fireproofing purposes. The 70s would also see them ban asbestos in cement pipes, artificial fire embers, and wall-patching compounds. In the 80s, it required schools to document asbestos and remove it if dangerous to protect children and teachers, though the cost of abatement was sometimes prohibitive. In 1989, the EPA created the ban and phase-out rule, which would have eventually led to a complete ban of asbestos-containing material. The phase-out rule, however, failed to pass a clause in the Toxic Substances Control Act that required the EPA to find the least burdensome means to accomplish the task. It was overturned in 1991. The 1989 Act did ban any new uses of asbestos. Today, 55 nations have banned asbestos entirely, but it's still not entirely banned in Canada and the United States, where it can still appear in some products. It's actually most popular in the third world, where the market's growing and regulation is lax. The last asbestos mine in the United States closed in 2003, the last one in Canada in 2011. And still, the legacy of asbestos exposure looms large, where an estimated quarter million people a year die from complications due to asbestos exposure, mostly from cancers like mesothelioma. And what was once touted as the miracle mineral that could solve almost any problem has now become the enemy. Large asbestos manufacturers like Johns Mansville and Turner and Newell have fallen apart in the face of asbestos litigation. Through the course of that litigation, we find out that they 
probably knew more than anybody about the risk of asbestos and hid much of that knowledge in order to protect their profits. Still, despite its risks, asbestos traces a long thread through the course of human history. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.